One evening, driving home, I was eager to unwind, and I had an unexpected encounter. I had this odd sensation, a warmth and a buzzing in my ears like the Holy Spirit was trying to get my attention. Well, I wanted nothing more than to get home, and so I tried to ignore it. Well, this intense this intensity grew and grew. And finally, I gave in, audibly saying, what do you want? And just then, I decided to make a choice to yield. I pulled over at an intersection where I had the right of way. And just then, a car sped through, skipped the stop sign, and nearly missed me. I yielded in a way that probably saved my life. And I was so shaken and yet so filled with awe and gratitude that it made me reflect. And it made me ask, how often do I just not want to yield in my daily life? For me, yielding feels like giving up my best laid plans, giving up control. I am just not that patient. Do you know what I mean? And so I had, I think, an epiphany. What if yielding, yielding especially for God, became a choice and a practice, a deliberate move towards something better? I might not even know what that is but that I would yield. Well, James teaches us that true wisdom comes from above, that God's wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, and yes, willing to yield. That kind of yielding isn't giving up control, it's about creating space, space for God's peace to enter our lives. Yielding is about making room. Yielding is making room in times of conflict. It creates understanding and grace and mercy. Yielding is, in moments of great puffed up pride, an opportunity to regain humility. Yielding, when we are impatient, or really giving in to selfish urges is an opportunity to gain some patience. And throughout these past weeks, we have been exploring the letter of James, and we have learned that every good gift comes from God, the very source of our life and light. We have learned that faith is not just heard, but faith is lived out through compassionate deeds, especially towards those who are in need. And we've been encouraged to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and to carefully choose our words so that they build each other up in love and not tear each other down in anger. And today, James teaches us the important practice of yielding, yielding to God and to one another. It's not a sign of weakness, but rather it is a mark of true strength, guided by wisdom. And it is a wisdom that can lead to peace and understanding and healing in our divided world. So what keeps us from yielding? Well, James provides an answer. We might not like it, but he gives it. You want something that you don't have, and so you engage in conflicts and disputes. We know that when we were children. We would fight over toys and treats, and it's the same as just as we are adults now. At the root of our resistance is a yielding because we are envious and selfish. There are times where these reside, and at all times where selfish ambition and envy reside, where the result, says James, is disorder and sin. Envy drives us to have what we don't have and what others have, 
And ambition can push us to gather up more than we really need. These are the forces that break down and fracture our relationships in our community and beyond. So James offers an antidote, an antidote to this human condition, pausing to experience a gentleness born of God's wisdom. Now, I know it's tempting to hit the gas pedal and to push forward with our agenda, to be right in every argument and to win at all costs, but James says there's a better way. God empowers us to yield with purpose and to create the good life and the beloved community that we desire. Jesus teaches this himself when he finds his disciples arguing about who is the greatest among them. Jesus doesn't scold them, he pauses and he calls them to yield to their ambition and to their pride. And he does this by taking a little child into his arms, showing us that true greatness comes through yielding, yielding to the needs of others. Jesus invites us to yield in this same way, to let go of our desires for recognition and control, and instead to embrace humility, generosity, and service. So how do we know? How do we know if we are truly content? Well, there is a great illustration in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and that is the mirror of Erised, which is desire spelled backwards. And in this mirror, when you look at it, it reflects back to you your greatest desire. For Harry, it was to see his long-lost parents. And for Ron Weasley, it was to hold up the big trophy and to be recognized as a winner. But the great Dumbledore reminded them that the happiest person in the world sees this. When they look into that mirror, they see themselves as they truly are a person who is contented and at peace. So as we go into our week, why don't we take a moment and look into that mirror? What does your reflection reveal? Are you driven by ambition and envy or pride? Or are you feeling content and at peace? Because when we stop striving for what other people have, we can rest in God's peace. And we can discover the best life we could ever hope for and imagine. A life of resting in God's contentment and overflowing with joy and with peace. Amen.